Welcome to our worship service here at St. Paul's United Church. We're really happy to have you come and join us. It is World Communion Sunday. You will see the elements behind me. And uh, so if you have forgotten that and you don't have your bread or your cracker or your beverage, uh, you might want to just hit the pause button for a minute and have that handy. And then later in the service, we will be inviting all to share in communion with us this day. So uh, welcome. You will see in the sanctuary with our worship um, items that have come from all around the world. Uh, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Africa, India, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Greece, um, China, uh, Japan. My goodness. Um, El Salvador. <clears throat> uh, so there's different things. Um, just to remind us that it is a World Communion Sunday, and we will be thinking of the whole global community at this time. So happy to have you here. Um, we do have some congregational news and Some updates. congregational Older news. Um, and sad news, first of all, I will begin with, uh, unfortunately, uh, the passing of Ray Middleton. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray and Annie were longtime members. Oh, he yeah. was a treasurer um, here at uh, St. Paul's, and uh, he passed away on the 24th of September, yeah. so our thoughts yeah. and prayers are certainly with Ray's family. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, we'll miss them mm -hmm. very much. Indeed. Yeah. Um, should also say that our Zoom coffee hour, there will not be a coffee hour on Thanksgiving. That's right. Because it would have been the second, it would have been on that Sunday. Yeah. So we won't do that on yeah. Thanksgiving. But Advance it's, um, notice. Yeah. Right. And that was decided by the whole mm. group of people. We range anywhere from 40 to 60 who come on that That's call awesome. for. Uh, and they decided to, to take a break that mm. uh, time. We want to just alert you, as we mentioned earlier last week, that we are uh, reopening our building for worship and for small groups. Um, that's going to be starting October the 24th. Mm -hmm. yeah. So pre-register, right? Yes. Uh, contact the office um, in the week before that particular Sunday. So between Tuesday and Thursday, yep. uh, if you can contact the office, uh, chat with Louise, and she will have um, some questions to ask, um, sort of COVID screening questions, and then you'll be pre-registered to come on Sunday morning for the service. Yeah, and we are asking those who are worshiping with us in person at this point in time to be fully vaccinated. So um, just call the uh, church office Tuesdays to Thursday and uh, Louise Terry and our church administrator can, uh, administrator can um, bring you in and uh, all the information. Our church minister, I like that. I know, She's you heard kind of me, but <laughs> we, do you know, we're all ministers, though. I'm just one oh, that's of many smooth, ministers that's in this nice. congregation, that's right? nicely said. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, we share the load around here. <laughs> <laughs> on that note then, what's our music today? Music. Uh, so again, I was noticing in the opening screen, right, a long list of singers um, being communion. We are opening with uh, We Gather Here, and that's uh, Rebecca uh, Amade. A lovely communion mm -hmm. piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, she does a beautiful job of it. We have changed out the, uh, the song response to the candle lighting starting this week. Bathe Me in Your Light. Uh, that's from More Voices. And this is um, the refrain, um, but it was recorded earlier by um, Barbara Benson, uh, Jane Smitham, and Myrna Jones from... Unity. Thank you. In Unity. Daisy. Yeah, lost yeah. my mind for a, a moment. Unity United Church <clears throat> worshipped with us at the beginning of the pandemic, yeah. and they're doing some wonderful work in their worship now. So uh, yeah. we appreciate bringing them back. And um, we have Shayla Brown uh, singing, Let us talents and tongues employ. Very in keeping for World Communion Sunday. Indeed, indeed. Um, and finally, uh, our St. Paul's, and Friends Virtual Choir again, doing a piece called One Song by Pepper Choplin, which we thought was appropriate for yeah, World, World Communion, Communion Sunday. Sunday. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, and of course, Victoria cl concludes with a beautiful postlude. Abide with me today. I always forward to that. Yeah, yeah. Always went, I went back to something a little old, uh, an old hymn, but with a new twist. Oh, terrific. <laughs> we'll look forward to that. On that note, 
On this day, as we gather, we think of the whole global community and we give God thanks and praise that we are not alone. We are part of the body of Christ throughout the world and we work with many people of many different faiths and no faiths to be about the compassion and love of God in the world. And so let us worship this day. Our opening hymn, We Gather Here. My name is Rick Dell. The prayers of the people are used with permission from the United Church of Canada. Most gracious and merciful God, amidst the din of howling winds, above the noise of rampaging waves, atop the earthquakes and the shaking of the earth, we hear your voice. Be still and know that I am God. Yes, even in times when we are prone not to be still, at moments when we are sorely tempted to resort to flight, we hear you and we pause to listen and to reflect, to stand still and recognize that indeed you are the God who is with us, that it is not in the wind or the waves or in the earth's tremors that you speak, and that even when we walk through the shadow of the valley of death, that we are not alone, that even when we are put in the crucible of a fiery furnace, that you are there to save. In times like these, you speak to reassure us through that still, small voice through the concrete acts of solidarity of partners and friends, through those who lovingly stretch out their helping hands to those ravaged by the storm, or those who are desolate and in despair, to those who are left with a threadbare of hope. In times like these, you assure us that we are not alone, that we have sisters and brothers who are moved to walk the lonesome valley with us. We thank you, for in times like these, your love and care are made more manifest and incarnate, made alive in concrete deeds of loving kindness and compassion. To you we return all glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We will now acknowledge the land. I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Huron-Wendat First Nations people and that we seek to be in right relationship with Beausoleil First Nations. We have had a painful and tragic past. May we together work for a more wonderful, honoring and dignity-filled future. Even in the dark, Jesus said, don't be afraid, I go before you always. 
Our scripture reading today is from the book of Job and is the beginning of Job's troubles and tragedies as he is tempted by God's adversary, the tempter or the Satan. Job 1 verse 1, the New International Version. In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Job 2 verses 1 to 10. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and the Satan, the tempter, also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to the Satan, Where have you come from? The Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to him, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, the Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to him, very well then. He is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So the Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat amongst the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish person. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this... Job did not sin in what he said. Perplexing words for today's reading, but may the Spirit guide us into understanding. Well, that's a story to hear, is it not? The story of Job is such a painful story and a long book. Some believe it's the oldest book in the Bible. And it's a very different story. It's an Old Testament parable. And it starts as a story because it was never intended to be a real person. It is a story, a parable. Once upon a time, there was a man named Job. And Job was upright and honorable and faithful to God. That's how the story begins. But then it takes an interesting twist, and a twist that always kind of throws us, because it takes us up to heaven, and there's God and the Satan. Now, Satan, or the Satan, or the Satan, is pronounced two different ways. He is the adversarial. He is the tempter. He is the one whose role it is to just uh, test people. It's not the little devil, it's not the person of evil, this is one of God's court in the book of Job. And so God says, oh my, look at Job, isn't he the most fabulous person of faith that we have on earth right now? He is always upright, he has integrity, and he always does what is good for others, and he never sins. My, my, that Job. I really, really think Job's pretty cool and really got it all together. He is faithful to me, says God. But the Satan says, Well, God, 
Of course he's faithful to you. You've blessed him. He has everything he could possibly ever want. He's a patriarch, he's an elder, he's known to be wise. He has tons of money, many kids. He is respected. Of course he's faithful to you because his faith has never been tested and he just gets goodness and good things one after another after another. So why wouldn't he be faithful? And God says, well, I think Job would be faithful even if he didn't have everything. Oh, says the Satan, the Satan, I think we should test him. So God says, okay, let's bet on it. I'll bet he'll still be faithful. And the Satan or Satan says, no, I don't think so. I think it's going to crumble. Once you take everything away from him, Job's going to crumble. He's not going to be that upright, faithful person. Because, you know what, he's going to have to go through suffering and struggles. And so, the test begins. Now, it's, it's all a story. It's a parable. It's really not true that God sends tests like that. It's a story of Job and a struggle to go through suffering and to come to an understanding of who he is as much as who God is. So as the story continues, Job loses his family members, except for his wife. He loses all of his wealth. Then he starts to lose his health, and he is struggling, and he is suffering. And Job's friends come to try to comfort him, and the wisdom of the day was that if you were good, then God blessed you. And if you were bad, if you were a sinner, then guess what? You didn't get any of the blessings of life. God punished you. So if that was the thinking of the day, then what happens here is his friends come and say, Come on, Job. What, what did you do? What did you, what did you do that God is now punishing you? And Job says, I didn't do anything. I am a man of integrity, and I have not done anything wrong. I do not deserve this suffering. Ah, oh, come on, Job. Come on, fess up. We know you did something because God doesn't punish those who are good. And Job gets angrier and angrier because he knows from his own experience and from who he is that he has done nothing wrong. And yet he is suffering. I want to pause for a minute because this is an old story. And yet it's still part of our story today. How many times do we say, well, I deserve that. I worked hard for that. Therefore, you deserve things. If you've worked hard, then you should be blessed. You should get the blessings of the joy. We even say all sorts of things. Well, I'm going to buy that now because I deserve it. It's this award kind of system that we have built into our society. And in fact, our materialism plays into that. You know, if you really made it, if you really want to be happy, well, you deserve to be happy, so just go get that extra thing. That new car is going to make you happy. Those new shoes are going to make you happy. That new furniture is going to make you happy. Just going out to that fancy restaurant, it's going to make you happy. We've got this sense that we can reward ourselves because we deserve it. And in rewarding ourselves, we will be happy. So it's part of our society's thinking today. And if you're not happy, then, then somehow it's your problem. That is so untrue. Happiness is not really something we could buy, nor is it something we should be pursuing. We should be pursuing a purpose in life and in the midst of it, finding happiness. If we're always looking for the next happy moment, if we're always striving for that next pleasure, then we're never going to be content with the pleasures that we have. And so it gets more and more and more complicated. 
When Job starts to suffer, his friends say, God is punishing you. What did you do? Now, we think that might be ancient thoughts, but how many of us have gone through some really hard times and we've said to ourselves, oh my, what did I do? Why is God punishing me? And it gets more and more complicated. We don't understand that this whole book is a pushback against that kind of thinking. When Job starts to see the suffering of himself, it opens his eyes to the suffering of others. And he is now more compassionate. He begins to understand that he can be faithful to God even in the midst of his suffering. But it takes him a while to get there. He takes God to court at first, and he says, God, you should be a just God. You are not just. If you were just, I wouldn't be suffering. And I get that. There is suffering in the world. And if we think everything is caused by God, how many times have you heard, oh, this is terrible. There must be a reason for it. Sometimes there's no reason. There's nothing that you did to deserve any of that. Cancer will find its victims because cancer is a byproduct of genetics, but it's also a byproduct of chemicals in our world, of treatments that we have put onto our food that we eat, of all sorts of very complicated reasons that has nothing to do with us personally in how we personally lived our lives, but we, how we have corporately chosen to live in a society. To suffer is to be broken. To suffer is to have to find courage to get through it, and not everyone does. The book of Job is about a man who seeks to remain faithful at the time in which his faith is being shattered. Because the God he thought he believed in is not the God that he is coming to experience now. It's an historical text that's pushing against that very thinking that if you're good, you'll be rewarded, and if you're bad, you'll be punished, and everything is so simple. It's a book that pushes for us to think beyond those simplistic, paternalistic, human understandings of God. And to know that bad things do happen to good things, and good things happen to bad people, and, and all of us are good and all of us are bad. It's a complex world. What I like about this book is, is Job's friends push him and say, this is our faith, and this is what you better believe, he gets angrier and angrier. Not just at them, but at the God whom he no longer believes in, in the same way that he did before. Because his God and his worldview is broadening. And that's another piece of this book that's so fascinating to me. I believe strongly that if we walk the path of faith, we will find ourselves being challenged again and again and again, not only with life and all of the complications of life, but with our understanding of God. And our Santa Claus God goes, and our God who is beyond understanding arrives. When God finally speaks to Job, he doesn't answer Job's questions. God simply says, Job, I created the world. I created you and I created the stars and the sun and the rivers and the animals and the lions. I created the very air that you breathe and I am in all things and I love and care for all things as well. 
So where does that leave us? For those who suffer, it leaves us reaching out to one another, to being able to live in the midst of pain and not lose sight of who we are, nor be defined by others. When there's suffering in the world, sometimes it makes us pause to rethink the societal values around us and to look at why suffering happens for some people. Poverty is not because the poor are lazy. Poverty happens because we live in the world where the rich are powerful and make up the rules of the game. We live in a world where we're called both rich and poor and everyone in between to challenge that. We live in a world where suffering can sometimes be mental health. And we blame people for not being happy without fully understanding that happiness is not something you can just create. It's, it comes out of our being and out of our frame of reference and it comes out of our mental health and well-being. Let me tell you about happiness. To be happy is to have a sense of purpose. To have a thing that you love to do. It's not about chasing things that you think will make you happy. It's about chasing things that give you purpose and meaning in the midst of it. You will find yourself with joy. Happiness is not that giddy feeling when you get a brand new car and you can hardly wait to get in it and it smells so good as well as drives so good. Happiness is about that deep inner sense of knowing who you are. In the book of Job, Job discovers who he is in the midst of his suffering. And he never stops being a man of integrity. And at the end of the day, as his understanding of God is changed and broadened, he remains a person of faith. And he finds joy again. He finds value and purpose again. He finds life again. At the end of the day, might that be true for us? At the end of the day, May we have courage to love ourselves. May we have courage to be people of integrity, no matter what happens to us, to say these are the values that I choose to live by. At the end of the day, even when we're struggling, may we be open to new possibilities and new visions of God and hope and grace. I don't know about you, but as I watched the news, I found it heartbreaking to watch Haitian people who live in one of the poorest nations on earth being whipped with real whips with people on horses who are border patrols in the state of Texas. The suffering of others. I watch and hear of the pleas of the people from Afghanistan and those who worked with the previous government and allied forces whose very lives at our risk. And I pray for them that in their suffering they will have courage and hope. And I think of people in Africa and people on our own country, on First Nations reserves without water. And how they have to struggle for the bare necessities of life. And I want that world to change. I think of those who have been affected by climate crisis. The fires in North America and across Europe and other parts of the world, the flooding, the hurricanes, the increase of tsunamis, the melting of glacier ice. In the midst of their suffering, they, 
they work together and have to find hope to rebuild. Job hang on. We need to hang on as a world. In this pandemic, we need to hold on together and work for solutions so that all might be able to be able to have the relationships that they had before and the ability to not be afraid. It's about trusting ourselves, trusting God, and trusting one another. Once upon a time, there was a man named Job who had everything he could ever possibly want. And then he lost everything. And he discovered that whether you have it all or life brings its own challenges, you can be true to yourself and true to God and praise our maker. Amen. And speaking about praising, I want to say that we are um, truly grateful for the ongoing support that we're receiving from you, our church members and our uh, community, faith, family. And uh, thank you for supporting the work of St. Paul's and the United Church of Canada and other organizations. It means an awful lot to us. At this point now, we're going to invite you to sing along with this wonderful video from Jamaica, the song, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ, as we prepare ourselves for communion. Wasn't that wonderful to have uh, Shayla singing again for us? And uh, Shayla, thank you for that. Um, Shayla has uh, really had her life uh, transformed through this pandemic. Uh, not only is she a singer, but she was actually uh, in an acting job uh, with um, a company that is for the visually impaired, and they've done some remarkable stuff. So she's now not only a singer, uh, but she's becoming an actress as well. And uh, we're just so happy. She's one of the young adults in our congregation, and she shares her gift of music as she reminds us that Jesus does live again. Earth can breathe again, and that loves abound. Here at uh, St. Paul's and in the United Church of Canada, we believe that the Lord's table, the Eucharist, is God's table. And so all are welcome to partake of the uh, bread and the wine. So if you're out there and you're not sure, please know that you are welcome to share with us. And uh, the United Church of Canada approved of virtual worship. 
So with that in mind, I think as in this world, Communion Sunday of how we gather on this Sunday with many, 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 many different churches in so many parts of the world. This is one of those Sundays like Christmas where an Easter where many denominations and individual congregations share communion on the same day. It reminds us that we are part of this very complex world, that even in its suffering and in its diversity, there is still joy and laughter. And even though we in the Christian church can have many different uh, theological differences and opinions, we are still united in Jesus Christ. We are still one in Christ. And we seek to follow the teachings and to live our faith in real and genuine ways. We remember that being part of the body of Christ is to be the church in the world around us. We remember that we are one in God and God is in us. And we remember and follow Jesus, who gives us so much joy and laughter and love and compassion in the world, but also walked with the suffering, knew suffering himself, who knew of vulnerabilities, who knew the challenge of betrayal, who had to grapple with his own fear and be challenged by the social norms of his time. It's this Jesus that we follow. It's this Jesus that we try to embody in the way in which we live our lives here and around the world. You see, it's this Jesus who reaches out and invites people to come that the loaves of God's love and compassion and justice abound. And when we partake of the bread, and of the wine, the juice, the tomato juice, whatever you have, that we partake in his memory and we invite Christ again and again to be the one we follow in our own lives. And so in many ways, we are like those first people when he came into Jerusalem, waving their palm branches and singing Hosanna. And so we will do our sanctus and Benedictus. Holy are you, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in your name. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Indeed, we sing our Hosannas and we're reminded of the joy of being in Christ. We're reminded that we are to see Christ in one another, in the faces of people in our communities, in our families, in the faces of people around the world. And despite our different faith perspectives, our different cultures, language, dress, orientation, despite all that could divide us, there's something larger that unites us. And so we are indeed God's people. And to be a follower of Jesus Christ is to be ones who walk with all. We walk in laughter and joy. We walk in suffering and vulnerability. And we share who we are in the midst of all of that. We walk with Christ who knew suffering and even died. And at the same time, we are not only the people who know the suffering and death of the world, but we are Easter people. And we know about resurrection and new beginnings and lives transformed. Because to be a follower of Jesus is to remember that we were part of the teachings he lived, 
he died, he rose again. And that's true in our personal lives and in the world today. And so I invite you to join me in the memorial acclamation. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ comes again and again into our lives and into our world. Christ comes when people see Christ in us and we see Christ in them. Christ comes in the midst of the brokenness because he knew about brokenness. And Christ comes in the midst of love. And Christ will come again and again as we live our lives as God's Easter people. And so we go to that upper room and we remember that in that place of fear and vulnerability there was courage and love to face the challenges that were ahead. And so Jesus broke bread and he blessed it. And he said, Take, eat this in remembrance of me. And so I invite you to take your piece of bread or cracker or whatever it is and to join me in the Lord's Supper. For this is Jesus, the bread of life, the bread in our life who nurtures and feeds us and our world. Do this in remembrance of him. And Jesus took the wine. He poured it. And he lifted that chalice long ago as we lift it today. And he reminded them, those early disciples, as he reminds us, that he is the vine. And we're the branches. That even though he would suffer and shed blood, that we need not be afraid. That we could go forward. And then even death could not take us away from the very presence and love of God. When he lifted that chalice and said, drink this in remembrance of me, it was not just the blood that was being shed for you and me and others. It was the reality that suffering, cruelty, oppression could not break him and is not to break us because there's resurrection and new beginnings and hope. So I invite you to take your beverage and to join me in the Lord's Supper. Jesus Christ, the living vine.
this point, I do invite you to join me with our prayer after communion, and it's going to be coming up on the screen, and I uh, hope that you will read it with me. Holy One, may the bread and the wine continue always to remind us that you welcome all to the table. May they also remind us that you call us to live our faith in radical ways of hospitality, grace, and compassion. Amen. Our closing hymn is one song, and that's by our St. Paul's and Friends a Virtual Choir. We're so delighted to have others, not just our own choir, be a part of this. And truly, it's one way in which we can be one together, one voice. We have indeed gathered here. We have been so grateful for the music that's been brought in and for having you 
part of our service today, albeit virtually. We heard many voices, but one song, and that is who we are as the body of Christ. Many people, but one in the body of Christ. And so as you leave this place, may you be stretched in your faith always to know that our God is bigger than any thoughts we have. And go forward in peace. Amen.